social media today, Robin Carey. <laughs> product. 
and it's a very cool solution, and we're proud to be their first B2B, content, B2B influencer content uh, partner. I think um, a number of you who were here last year would remember that we announced SMT Smart Course, which is our way of creating content in the e-learning platform. So I'm very proud to be able to announce that we're partnering with Gomo Learning, which is a UK-based authoring and hosting tool for uh, e-learning, and we're opening up to our contributors the opportunity to work with us on very high-end, very niche, and very interactive e-learning. I'd also like to announce our partners with this enterprise. We're going to be partnering with Likeable uh, Media for the small business part of e-learning, um, but we're also going to be partnering with Neil Bedwell. Neil, can you raise your hand? Uh, with his consulting group on creating that quality environment. We also have a tremendous faculty who we have, who we're going to be working with for the initial e-learning modules and, and classes. Um, among them, Chad Pollock, Chad, you're going to be coming up later, Bree Bage from SAS, Dan Gingas from, from um, Discover Financial Services, Vanessa DeMauro of Leader Networks, David, David Amelan, Liz Bullock, and Banache Gassemi. And we've done some great research already on what our audience wants, but these guys are going to be continually engaging with the audience to provide really, really very fabulous e-learning modules for our audience. So, there's going to be a lot of value for contributors coming up, and it's always great to find out in the audience how many of you are contributing to social media today. Can we get a show of hands? Wow, that's great. I mean, I see about 30 or 40 people. That's terrific. You're the backbone of what we do. And I'd love to bring to the stage one of our leading contributors, one of our best thinkers, Chad Pollock from Indianapolis. Chad has come all the way to talk about what he's doing. So thank you so much, Chad. Please give a round of applause. So, I'm the VP of Audience for Relevance. Relevance it has two main business functions. One, we have a digital magazine uh, that specializes in content strategy, content promotion, and content marketing. And then we have an enterprise serving digital marketing agency. So, in a nutshell, those are the two main focuses. Of the and how did you find us? And why did you seek to be part of what we're doing? So, Actually, back, clear back in 2010, uh, the, one of the co-owners of Kuno Creative, an agency I used to work for, uh, he was contributing content to social media today, and he recruited me to do it as well. So that's how I got started. Cool. Well, it's all about community. Yes. So tell me a little bit about your experience with SMT, and, and do you find it valuable? Yeah. I mean, is it, is it paying off for you? Oh, absolutely. Um, so in my entire career in digital, I've been creating content. In fact, I calculated it. It's over 800 articles I've written. And a huge chunk of those have been published on your platform. Now, out of all the, well, just since you've launched the Best Thinkers program, mm -hmm. um, it's driven over 100 top of the funnel leads for our agency. That's fantastic. Uh, we have, it's, they convert about 23%. And without boring everybody with the details of the percentage breakdown in our funnel, on average that equates to a few million dollars in revenue for our agency. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> so glad you're here. Well, listen, I hope we continue to work well with you. As you know, we've got MJ Wesner to work directly with you to make sure that we're optimizing the experience and giving you the best data we can. So. Thank you so much for coming, and particularly for all of your ongoing 800 blog posts. Thank you so much for everything, Chad. You're welcome. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd just like to share a bit of what we're hearing out there in the market. 
when we talk to companies, large and small, about the state of social business. Last year, as some of you may have known if you were here, we did a quick survey on what we call the social change agent. And we asked people in our audience if they identified with that term, social change agent, what it meant for them in terms of their career satisfaction and their, and, and their career security. We found that 76% of them said that they felt that they had generated much more career satisfaction and security as a result of their being change agents within their organization. And, and we threw back at you guys that you are the change agents for what you're doing in your companies. We're more determined, at Social Media Day, we're more determined than ever to support the social change agent. But I'd like to throw yet another idea at you, which is you social change agents are the next generation CMOs. Why do I think that? Well, we live in a new world, and a world where the customer is king and now has a loud and powerful digital voice. Social business has fundamentally changed the ways that companies connect with and engage their customers. When we had our first social shakeup, it was my privilege to bring you Wes Nichols, market chair who had just written this cover story in Harvard Business Review about advertising, particularly advertising of the future, but the advertising of the past, which didn't work. And in fact, Wes talks about how what he described as the sort of swim lane approach of marketing, where different divisions within marketing were all doing their own thing, not talking to each other, and reporting results. And this resulted in such an enormous distortion that one Fortune 200 CEO we talked to actually said, CFO that he talked to said, you know, if I counted up all the ROI that the different marketing divisions in my company report, I'd actually have a company twice its size in revenue, twice our size in revenue. So that was the old days. And the new days, of course, is completely different because everything can be measured. And now that everything can be measured and often in real time, marketing campaigns and content can be attributed in ways that take ROI inflation down to zero, at least approach it. Of course, there's also greater testing. We've all been talking about this all day. And because testing is fast and cheap through virtual and printed products, there's a greater opportunity for nimble campaigns that can iterate on the fly. Collaboration is more possible than ever, and now we're collaborating across customer service and sales and with your own customers so that those swim lanes that Wes Nichols talked about, they're disappearing. Data is key, of course, but not just unlocking existing corporate data, but bringing in social listening and social data, like what Trax does. And you can certainly see how this is beginning to have an impact on performance metrics. We're starting to hear about that a lot. Ad strategies, because of programmatic, can be iterative. But they're also, what I'd like to see is ad strategies where programmatic complements what influencers are doing and what the non-programmatic parts of what you're doing are going to come together and also provide us with new metrics and can talk to each other. Customers are now a resource and not a problem, and they're brought into the conversation. Thanks to mobile, the, your customers' experiences of your brand have shifted to social, so that now social isn't just the first mile of the customer experience, it's also the last mile where you're engaging through customer service with your brand or with your company and solving problems in real time. We had a really interesting post by Drew Neeser last week, or a couple weeks ago. Drew, are you in the audience? You better be. Okay, great. All right, great, great post about Bob Kraut at Papa John's. And Drew, Drew interviews CMOs for social media today every week. And Papa John's took an old, you know, great customer retention strategy of loyalty programs, and they've turned them into digital and socially enabled products now that can target your customers based on their personas, on geolocation, and then that data goes back and strengthens the program further. I mean, it's a great melding of traditional marketing with what is now available to make that relationship stronger. Nimble is the new marketing mantra, and a great example of this is the IBM Design Lab. And I'm, I'm 
I'm sure a number of you in this room have been privileged to go through the IBM Design Lab, but where you can see marketing treated like a product, where it gets this agile framework and then design for marketing is built right into the entire experience. So, what does this mean for next generation CMOs like yourselves? Well, you've got a whole new job. And that new job isn't just about marketing. You're gonna be the leaders for product development as well. We brought to Social Shake Up, again, we're speaking in tomorrow morning's keynote, Mark Hatch of the Maker Movement, right? Why would the Maker Movement be important to you guys? Well, I'm sure you've already figured that out because that's why you're here in this, you're the next generation CMOs. But this whole ability to create products based on customer input and be able to create them so rapidly that even if they fail, as Mark Hatch says, you've got a really great data point. And you guys are going to be the leaders for that. Finally, as everyone knows, the CMOs, and thank you, the CMOs budget for technology has exploded. But with greater budgets comes greater responsibility. With, with, for you, I mean for many CMOs, not you guys, that budget, I believe, is really creating a kind of an insecurity. CMOs are even more visible than they were before when they were double reporting ROI because they've got such enormous budgets. And so I sense that there's a tension into which you guys, coming in from your backgrounds with nimble, with customer uh, engagement practices, with an understanding of social as the first and the last one, with a great acceptance of the role that participation plays in the product development. You guys have the keys to the kingdom. And I want to see every one of you get your promotions next year. So, without further ado, and I think this is a good way to introduce her, I'd like to bring to the stage Dana Middleton. Dana and I met at South by Southwest, and when, the, the minute I heard her speak, I said, you've got to come to shake me. And she is an author, she is the head of global marketing for Twitter, but she's also an original. She grasped social years before many people in this room did it. It's such a pleasure to bring a social media original, as well as an expert marketer, and the global head of marketing for Twitter, Dana Middleton. Please welcome her.
you had somebody like John Grant who looked at mortality tables and for the first time started to apply math to that and understand that he could predict the accurate population of London. So here's statistics important to us today. 1741, first magazine is published. 1786, William Playfair created data visualization or statistical graphics for the first time. I think sometimes, at least I know I do, I take for granted what my computer does with tables of numbers and actually creates visual images. Imagine doing that by hand which Mr. Playford um, demonstrated first. Early 1800s, what's happening, the Industrial Revolution is happening here in the United States, and that's causing an excess of product. And remember, during this time, clear into the 1960s and 70s, we have a shortage of information, and we have a shortage of distribution. It starts right here. So you have companies really needing advertising because they need to tell people about their products because people can't find out about them. There's no good efficient way to do that. First magazine ad runs, 1844. How many people know who Florence Nightingale is? You've heard of her, right? Yes? Did you know she was the first person to create an infographic? How many people knew that? A few. So this is called a circular histogram. What she was trying to do was convince generals in the Crimean War that they needed to invest in sanitation and additional nursing. So if you look at the center, you can see the red portion. Those were soldiers who died from their battle wounds. The black, and by the way, each one of those represents a month, so she's keeping track of this. The black is mortality from another cause. And the blue or gray is mortality caused by disease primarily driven by bad sanitary conditions. So a great little fact for you in terms of obviously infographics, very important to us today. 1890, Herman Holler creates a tabulating machine that goes on to become IBM. 1893, Sears and Roebuck delivers their first catalog. 1903, we have the first telegraph. So you have Theodore Roosevelt who sent a message that traveled all the way around the world in 12 minutes, he had it back. So suddenly you have a connection from a global standpoint. Moving forward, 1910, electricity is standardized, creating a market for household appliances, like the radio, 1920, launched in Pittsburgh first here. 1920s, people are able suddenly to use a credit card, again, thanks to Sears Roebuck. 1938, radio ad avenue, revenue surpasses that of magazines. So this is the first leapfrog we saw in our industry, and less than 10 years later, we see the next leapfrog, TV surpassing that of both radio and magazines. In 1967, first 60 second Super Bowl ad, look at what it cost. What it cost today, guys? What was the cost for this year's 30 second month? 4.5 million. 1975, VCRs hit. People are suddenly able to time shift. And in 1981, we have the personal computer. Also in the early 80s, we have what's called the ARPANET, which is really the, the pipes that connect the internet. Started here in the US, funded by a military project. And in 1993, it would extend around the globe. This is transformational, because then you had Tim Berners-Lee actually create the communication that enabled the ARPANET. The article off to the side, honestly, is a spoof, for those of you who haven't seen. The sun spoofed themselves on their site, which is kind of fun. Then in 1990, you have cell phones. <laughs> Isn't that a great cell phone? 1993, whoops. The internet has five million users. This is the first year that ARPANET's complete this year, and already you have five million users on the internet. 1995, suddenly content is starting to get on the internet, and people need to find it. So you had the birth of search engines, first all the things that Yahoo, shortly followed by Google and MSN. And also in 1998, the term big data was coined. So you had a Silicon Graphics employee who talked about the waves of infra stress that all of us were going to endure because of access to massive waves of data. 2000, we had Baidu launch in China and Yandex in Russia, search engines. And in 2000, we had 400 million users on the internet.
making it the fastest growing medium since ever. Think about where we just came from in history and what the internet is creating. 2000, you have spam everywhere, MySpace launches, I think so yesterday. <laughs> Facebook launches in 2005 and Reddit as well. The iPhone in 2007, was it only 2007? Only 2007. Same year as Twitter is born. You had Weibo, which is like a hybrid of Twitter and Facebook launch in China in 2009. And because of the plethora of cable and the beginning of digital, you start to see 1,700 television stations and 14,700 radio stations. Today, there are over a million television stations, which is amazing. So the social media landscape in 2012 looks something like this, although I couldn't fit everything on the page. Um, in 2012, you have short attention spans, spurring visual content. So you see Pinterest popping. You see videos start to take off like Vine. But it's not just about social that isn't, doesn't have commercial value. In Asia, you start to see commercial value on social networks where people are participating to actually get a product or service. So that quick glance back was to show you that not only has the media landscape grown, it's really, each type has increased in volume incredibly over a very short period of time. So if you go to the live internet stats page this morning when I looked at it, there were roughly 3.14 billion internet subscribers. And it kind of stresses you out because you can watch people adding, jumping onto the internet live if you go to the page. There are roughly approximately 417 web pages for every single person, and that doesn't even account for all of the words on a page or images on a page. 500 million tweets a day to remember this moment a year and a half ago. Really seems simple. A nice little selfie. This is what happened seconds after this selfie was posted to Twitter. And no, we did not orchestrate this, by the way. Would have been brilliant, had we. But really what happened on Twitter was only a small reflection of then what happened in the hours that followed off Twitter, beyond Twitter, in magazines, on televisions, all over the world. So this tweet, which was really easy for us to calculate, roughly 3.4 million retweets, it took down Twitter for a short period of time. We had Cantor help us, and of course we had the $3.3 billion or $3.3 billion Oscar impressions that happened shortly after that. But then calculating everything beyond that, 60% of the world's population saw this selfie. 60% of the world's population saw this selfie. And it caused really a selfie global phenomenon that followed. These were two soccer players here shortly after the Ellen in the tweet that you see the queen in the background. So the queen photobombs are selling. If you want to take this to the next level, how many of you know of a company called Nube 3D? You can actually get your selfie 3D printed in a variety of different sizes from very small action figure size to life size, depending on how much you're willing to pay. So the whole notion is. If you think about today, brands find participants. Participants. Brands don't find participants. Participants find brands. And the whole retrospective for history was to get you to think about the fact that from a marketing standpoint, all of our tools, our processes, our philosophies are grounded when radio and television first came into the fold. I started my career, that was how I was taught. How to find that big idea, that emotional hook, that then we could reach so many people three times and our job was done. It was really easy. And persuasion was really important because if I could find that big idea that persuaded people to change their mind, then my job was done. But I worked on a campaign when I was at Hewlett Packard. I spent 16 years in marketing at HB. This was in 2006, and it was a beautiful campaign, classically beautiful. We had television, we had print, we had celebrities like Lynn Stefani and others. 
And we have these assets that could be customized and people could go online and create something. And ironically, the tagline for the campaign was, what do you have to say? But what was amazing at the time, and remember this is a little bit before social, so as I just took you through the historical perspective, you know that Facebook was brand new and Twitter was yet to be born. HP had no intention of wanting to know what anyone had to say. <laughs> and the first time in history, people could actually say something back. And that was a huge aha for me. That was an aha that it was no longer enough to have a beautiful campaign with a beautiful persuasive message that, by the way, was supposed to be about printing self-expression. <coughs> what we really needed was to get people to participate with us in a campaign. And so this is when I left, actually, HP and went off to try some things about this whole notion of participation and experiment with it in new and different ways. So I'm gonna jump back again and really, to illustrate this point, give you a few examples. So I'm gonna go back to 1982, to Star Wars. How many of you are old enough to have seen Star Wars in the theater? Great, we have a few of us, I'm one of those. And in this period of time, you actually had two Star Wars movies that had been out by this time, but Star Wars still is the second highest grossing film today if you adjust for ticket price inflation. So roughly in 1982, it cost $1.65 to go watch Star Wars. And it was very much a passive one-way approach, right? You're sitting in the theater, you're watching Star Wars. No real participation other than paying attention on the screen. Another little company came along, same time frame. How many of you have played Space Invaders? Yeah. There are some of you old enough to remember. How much did it cost to play Space Invaders? Does anybody remember? A quarter. Eight billion quarters in revenue. More money than Star Wars. In a little arcade game that came to the US during this period of time. What's interesting about Space Invaders is all of the gaming companies feel like that Space Invaders was the first to really discover the killer app, as they called it. And the killer app involved the components of the participation formula. Players could discover new things and respond to movements and even enemies responded to players for the first time. They were empowered to take away movable barriers and actually use them to defend themselves. And for the first time, someone could actually keep score and you would run back to the arcade machine and see if someone had beaten your score. You might not know who that person was, but suddenly you were able to connect with someone and have a competitive relationship with someone. There was also that little diatonic music that would get faster as the enemy approached or as you got closer to the enemy, like your heartbeat. These are all components. All right, here's another example. How many of you know Minecraft and have played Minecraft? A few. <laughs> Minecraft was built for participation from the ground up. It is the amorphous of participation. And I'm gonna share with you a short little video that demonstrates this. Minecraft is huge, with more than 100 million players, 19 million PC downloads, and 54 million units sold. Minecraft is one of the biggest video games on the planet, but those numbers are just the start. In 2011, Minecraft had 241 million in logins per month. In 2014, Microsoft bought the game for $2.5 billion. And today, those players have played more than 2 billion hours on the Xbox 360 alone. In a 24-hour span, the game has had as many as 16,000 downloads and $350,000 of in-game purchases. And in January of this year, developer Nathan Adams tweeted that more than 998 thousand people were playing at once and that was not a peak play time. So how does the game fit all these thieves in their land and cause it? Well according to several users, the entire Minecraft overworld has enough volume for one quintillion. 
48 quadrillion 576 trillion square meter blocks, and the maximum theoretical surface area is 4 billion 96 million square kilometers, which is about eight times greater than Earth's. And if you wanted to explore all of it, one user calculated that it would take about 3 trillion hours or about 4.4 million average human lifespans. Another user calculated that the game could generate 18 quintillion possible worlds. One brave Minecrafter named Kurt J. Mackey who decided to try and walk to the edge of his world. So far he has walked more than 919,592 miles and at his current pace. It will only take him another 21 years to get there, which is right because he has already raised over $269,000 with his Minecraft charity once. So beyond incredibly long walks and running from creepers, what do players do in a world this large? Build mega structures, of course. One user built the Tower of Babel with over 7 million blocks and 90,000 lights. Another built a track 8 miles long, the half hour drive in the Minecraft Sark. The Danish Geodata Agency even created the entire country of Denmark on a one to one scale. It has 4 trillion blocks, takes up a terabyte of data, and is one of Minecraft's 12 world records. Of course, if you want to know just how big Minecraft really is, all you have to know is that in 2014, Minecraft was the number two search term for all of you too, beating out Beyonce, Taylor Swift, and even Frozen. Like we said, Minecraft is huge. When you enable participation, when you create an environment that has all of the key components that invite people to participate, amazing things happen, clearly. So here is the formula that I'm talking about, and I didn't invent this formula. This formula was built on the principles of self-determination theory or intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation and self-determination theory have been used from a commercial or work standpoint before. They've been used for human resources. It's how do you create an environment that provides a great place where employees want to come to work and continue to come to work for retention. It's also, as I, I mentioned, been used for education. How do you create classrooms that actually are conducive to learning? And obviously it's been adopted by the gaming industry because obviously if you don't have participation in the gaming industry, you are not going to be very successful. This formula is not a quantitative formula. I used to work for a very quantitative company. I used to convince them that if you try to do the math, it will not work. It simply is put in an equation form to help you remember it. So when you're creating marketing programs, you keep this in mind. So D is for discover. But discover is not about finding things. It's about the fact that we as humans like to continually learn. And even more important than learning is becoming confident. So there's a huge amount of satisfaction about competency. So this is why you can think about how brands or companies allow people to unlock certain levels based on their knowledge or their competency. This is the notion of discovery. And generally not too big of a far reach for brands because we like to tell people about our product and service. The next one is about empowerment. And empowerment is about the fact that people need a meaningful role in the process. This just makes sense, right? If you're going to take part in something, then you want to have a meaningful role. It starts to get more difficult here, though, because from a brand's perspective, that means ceding some control, which, by the way, the control was already gone based on the history lesson you've had. But it's so difficult to let that go. And lastly, the third one is a component about connection. And not just about connecting from a brand to the participant, but how do I actually create a community? We as humans love to communicate with other people who have similar interests to our own. So how do I as a brand facilitate that? If you do this, then you have greater participation. And because actions are the manifestation of participation, what happens? That means you have better performance because we're all measured on actions today. So this is the simplicity of the formula. Here's another event. Obviously, it's the UK. Any ideas on what's happening? These are these are tweets happening. What event is this? Any ideas? Soccer. Soccer. Good idea. World baby. World baby. Baby. World baby could be. Great question. This is Tuesday morning. <laughs> these are people commuting to work, and they're talking about their commute. Using Twitter, we can actually pull this kind of data and show that commuters are talking about their commute. And they're also talking about the fact that they would just like the other commuters to just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
wouldn't we all? So Nokia did something very clever. They took that insight and they created a campaign on Twitter that just makes everyone else disappear. Here's one more. Social data can be used to really inspire participation. So you think about something like the Avengers movie, which was huge over the weekend. So Mark Ruffalo started tweeting about the launch of the new Avengers from the very first day of shooting the movie and continued throughout. I just pulled a few tweet examples. What's interesting though is look at the participation that occurred. So this weekend, the movie was hugely successful, even more so than the other franchisees. So the, the studios are starting to learn that get, getting participation early is an important part of their process. And obviously, you can find that the conversations are not happening in the traditional old media forms. They're happening in social, they're happening live, they're happening in real time, they're happening now. I bet they didn't anticipate this, though. Who watched this movement outlay on Twitter? We need more women superheroes. I would agree with that, yes. So it's demand, here's participation saying, we have a voice. We can't put this voice back in the box. Participation is alive and well. So now that you understand kind of why participation is the new persuasion, and you understand that there's a formula for it, the last concept I really want to leave you with today is about the, the nerd's wrist. So when I did all the research for the book, I, I went back and I researched a lot of all the tools and philosophies that we use. And one thing that struck me is the fact that our primary metaphor for marketing is war. We target our customers. We use guerrilla tactics. We capture share. And my thought was, if we're trying to build relationships with people, we probably need a new metaphor. And so I'm proposing that we use more of a gardening approach called the nurturist. And this concept is not just for marketing, because the reality is, as Robin said earlier, marketing touches so many parts of the organization today that these really need to be bigger than marketing. They need to be values that are prevalent throughout the entire organization. So the first one is about testing and learning. So the only way to really scale in today's fast-moving cycles, and I tried to demonstrate those fast-moving cycles today if you look back in history, is the fact that you need a cornerstone part of your marketing efforts and your dollars to really find out what's working. The minute you start to see one of your marketing activities decline, then you have something to put in place. It's the only way you can reasonably scale. When I was at Performance, probably our most progressive clients were spending 30 to 40% on testing and learning in their budget, which is tremendous, and constantly adjusting that. So the second rule is about innovation, not perfection, and obviously somewhat related to the first. It's about that our world is moving very, very quickly. If we operate marketing the way we did the old world, which is spent months on a great big idea, that no one else has ever done before. We will never get anything in the marketplace and our competitors will beat us. So this whole notion of being perfect or being first or being first, the only one to create this notion is false. Get out there before your competitor does. The third one is about acting quickly and motivating others. So Robin also mentioned the fact that we have all these silos in organizations and marketing touches many, especially social today. So you can't do social without customer support. You can't do social without product management. So number three is about creating governance models that enable you to move quickly. So when I worked with Verizon years ago when they were setting up their social account, we got 60 people in a room from all of the different departments and created what is scenarios and then a plan for those what-if scenarios. That's what a governance plan is about. Planning for the future and working across departments to be able to move quickly and respond to customer needs. Number four is about partnerships. Partnerships are key in today's world and they can actually provide you that differentiation that you might not otherwise have. 
And lastly, and probably more encompassing of all of the others before this, is having an appetite and an environment for failure. So I'm not talking about perpetual failure, but this is part of the testing and learning process. So the best example I have for this was when I was at Performance, we worked with a great client who twice a year produced an amazingly beautiful catalog. That catalog sat on a coffee table, sometimes for weeks or months, it was beautiful. And the company knew that if they could actually capture the demand within the first few weeks following that catalog drop, that they actually could do some great things with that, that they actually knew it was there. But in order to do that without destroying efficiency was really hard. And that's what our team's job was. We worked very closely with the client. And we failed three times before actually figuring it out on the fourth try. And that took me as the CEO of a company being okay with failing as a partner for a client. And it took the client being okay with that failure, knowing that at one point in time, we were actually going to achieve the desired result. So this whole notion of being okay with failing in the pursuit of results is key for the new nurturous world. So, in closing, participation is here to stay. We are not gonna put participation back in the box. We are not going to take away control from individuals who do have something to say, who do want to respond to us. And think about that in the context of your marketing plans. When I was at Performance, we changed our language from consumers to participants. Not because I was anti-consumer or we didn't believe in that, but because if we kept using the same language, we kept doing the same motions, we kept using the same tools and approach. If we thought of these individuals as participants, then the way we viewed them was so much different. Secondly, there is a formula for participation. You can, as a marketer, create an environment that is more conducive to participation. And this is true for any, even if you want to break down to less of an overall marketing approach and just think about it in the construct of search. And then lastly, we need a new metaphor for our industry. War is no longer applicable. When we're trying to build and maintain and sustain relationships with our customers, let's think of a gardening metaphor. How do we nurture those relationships? Thank you.
Um, but you talk about the, um, the, the sort of underlying interactivity, creating new engagements and experiences. What, what does this mean for the future? So that's an interesting question. So um, what's, what I didn't anticipate, and by the way, this book was written four years ago. So um, it seems to be kind of like hitting its stride now. But what I think is happening next is you look at devices are starting to participate on our behalf and using the internet as a, as a vehicle for that. So you think about your nests at home. I'm sure that when we start to use more push device watches, we're seeing the internet shift from being a full medium to really a, a more of a notification medium in so many ways. And then, so I think the next challenge is as marketers, as we figure out how do we start to, how do we embrace this in our overall marketing mix? How do we start to take into account that there are also devices communicating on behalf or participating on behalf of people? And how do we, how do we fix that? I don't have an answer for that, but I think really, if you look at the age of participation, the next wave of that is really device participation. Um, beyond the human one, or an extension of the human one, which is interesting. How many marketers represented are really ready for these changes? Uh, I think they're still dealing with this. Will you guys answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> if you have a nurturist organization, are you thinking about participation, or are you still just trying to do a one-way push communication for marketing? I, I think many organizations are still, still faced with challenge A, which is how do I move from more of a push communication from a time when communications and distribution were scarce um, to the new world that we, we are living in today. Well, these are the guys who are going to push for that. So. They are. I see. You were, you were born with social. You believe in social. Totally. Any more any questions? Because we're going to have to sort of shout out because we can't find this in the And don't be shy. We won't laugh. Please. <laughs> I think they're ready for their I'm the only thing standing between <laughs> you and your brain. Well, Jake will be around for a little while. So, so we're, we're, we're talking about participation. How do you, how do you? Right. Brian. Yes. Oh, and P.S. This is Brian Banzo's birthday. Hey. Hey. Happy, birthday. Happy birthday. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Uh, so from participation, how do, what are your strategy from like, especially from even Twitter, from a overall marketing perspective to get a newbie to a power user or really the learning curve to make the learning curve from a participation perspective more user friendly I guess from a standpoint of only not only engagement but really um, people kind of leveraging their tools because I think that's something that um, you know Twitter does drive amazing participation but that learning curve from a, a newbie or the lurkers that are on Twitter that aren't tweeting to someone that's a power tweeter that's sitting in this room is, is steep. Well, that's a, that's a whole Followers who, who were providing me with really valuable and relevant content, 
And that's not something that we talk about. That's just one of many examples of where I think we could, we could do a better job. Great question. Other questions? I think there's one in the back. It's sort of Sure. Please uh, say who you are. Uh, my name is Bill Colazar. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of American Family Care in Birmingham. Uh, Seth Godin gave us permission marketing. You, you've given us participation marketing. Put your futures hat on and as you look down the road, maybe five years from now, what, what's the next, next thing that we all need to be thinking about even though we haven't figured out everything there is to know uh, in the current state? Yeah, it's interesting. I do think something to do with this this push-based approach, which is almost like notification marketing, which is like participation to the next level. Um, I, I look at my children and um, their definition of advertising is not my definition of advertising. If there's a value exchange involved, that's, that's not advertising to them. That's something very different. And so I think this next um, generation will truly expect the interaction with brands to be completely relevant and customized for them. And I don't know what you call that. I think it's the next phase beyond participation. And again, if it's notification or, or, or relevance, what, whatever that is, um, that's where I think we're headed. One of the things that I love about Twitter, I remember when we met, I said, oh my God, you know, Twitter didn't exist, we have to invent it, is that in, in an age in which everyone's striving to be relevant, Twitter provides us with a great sense of discovery. You, know, you can go onto Twitter, you can see what's trending, you can just kind of browse, you can graze. Sure. Um, and it's been absolutely critical to the success of publishers. And you, you know, not just us, probably you know, half the publishers in the world now, Twitter is their greatest so so source of social search. What, what does that mean? I mean, is there still a role for the random, for the unanticipated, the un-catered you know, to that you the world you're describing. Sure, so I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I find things on Twitter that I don't find anywhere else, and it's not just in the very specific narrow band of what I'm seeking, I guess. If, if I probably have a pretty broad base of um, interest that I'm following, so maybe that's part of it. Um, but it's, you know, it is that broader world, and what I love most about it is that it is an equal platform. So. I don't have any more status than the President of the United States does or anyone else. And the fact that you can actually have an, um, a conversation potentially with anyone at any time is that flat platform that does make it very unique as well. I also think the, the, the fact that the recency element of it I think is also amazingly unique. So um, it's one of the reasons why I think Twitter was keen to have, or, or uh, Google was keen to have Twitter show up in the feed, right? So. If, if something is happening and you need to know right now, um, there is probably no better tool for that than, than Twitter. And, and how many Periscope users do we have in that audience? Yep, a few. Your Honor, so if you haven't used... Uh, <laughs> are you Periscoping now? We're, we're too. Yeah. They're right here. Yeah, and Meerkat. Lots of Periscope. And Meerkat. And Meerkat. If you haven't tried... Double fisting it. With him and us. The live feed tools, it will, really is kind of an amazing thing and where that goes. And, then, and more important probably, probably is the expectations of people in terms of knowing something and the recency and the now and the live. I think this will make it even um, more <laughs> urgent for individuals than it has in the past. Great answer. Questions? I have a question. I'm Travis Albert, publicist like Brands Medicus. Um, I thought the structure of your presentation was very interesting because it covered so much history and time. And when I think of Twitter, I think of very contextual, brief conversations. Do you have any insight on how Twitter is going to age um, or where that might go in the next two to five years? Because just the juxtaposition of those things, I think, is very interesting. Yeah. Please let us in on your strategic plan. <laughs> I don't even know what's your, uh, your uh, no, I'm safe and you're safe, both. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question because that was further the question that I just answered. I think now it's becoming more and more urgent. It's like, will there be even a subset of now? Does that make sense? Right, where, where time suddenly shifts in really interesting ways and we have a completely different perspective of what now is and what the past is and what the future is. 
Um, I hope not. I hope that we're able to actually have both that and we still have the, the richness. And honestly, I think even now, um, sometimes I feel like people lose the moment that they're actually in because they are attached or somewhere else. We were talking about that this morning because I happen to live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And if you've ever flown in or out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, it may be one of the most gorgeous places that you would ever fly into anywhere. Um, and it's amazing how many times I fly in and people aren't even looking out the window. They're on their devices. And I'm like, you're, you're, you're missing. <laughs> you're missing the real world. And I, so I think that is a very interesting question and something I think culturally that we have to ask ourselves um, as we move forward into the future. I can think of, oh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Hi, back here behind Travis. Another. Hi, Travis. Hi, yes. how are you? Hi, Travis. Yeah. Um, I'm Alicia Case, Pugles is Life Brands Medicus as well. Um, and one um, thing that you brought up that was interesting to me was the, the saturation of your feed. Um, and one area that's always intrigued me is the idea of your competitors. So just taking two brands, Coke and Pepsi, they might view each other as competitors and somebody might want to... Is they? What? No, 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 no. That's my point is that, that, yes, they are competitors. But to me, a competitor actually could be Jimmy Fallon because of the fact that he's consuming my feed and I care more about what he puts up than they ever would. So a competitor could just be anybody who takes your attention away from someone else. So Coke and Pepsi may not ever view Jimmy Fallon as a competitor, but meanwhile, seemingly, they're taking my attention away from the feed. So what would you recommend for brands to really figure out who's taking them away other than their traditional you know, competitors that might be in like the soda, you know, uh, packet, you know, food brands, if you will, because I think that that's a problem now, is that it's not the traditional, oh my god, my other beverage competitor is, it's that someone else is way more entertaining and I pay more attention to them altogether. Yeah, so I think there's two, there's two issues there. So the first one you talked about, which I think a lot more brands are really becoming savvy about the fact that if I'm a watch brand, um, my competitors might not be another watch brand. If I'm an expensive watch brand, it might be I'm competing with a car or I'm competing with concert tickets, or you know, it's a lifestyle choice of how I'm gonna spend that money from a luxury standpoint. And so understanding your competitive set from a broader perspective than perhaps just your individual category, I think more and more brands are becoming savvy about that. And actually even using Twitter too, or other social avenues to gain insight about that. How can I learn more about what's really is passionate, my consumers are passionate about. But then the other part of your your um, your notion is really about how do I find out who's taking time or space or mind share away? And what I would recommend is that you encourage your brands to determine how can I pro provide value to the individual consumer instead of what who's taking it away? What am I doing to give that value back? Because I think that's the other side of the coin, but a much more powerful place to be. So the brands that I think are really moving forward in this world, are looking at the broader competitive set, but they're also really understanding transparency, authenticity, and what do I truly, honestly, what value am I providing my constituents? How can I deliver against that? And the true focus on that versus focusing on the competitors is what really is making a big difference. Great question. Uh, one more question before, uh... <coughs> Cocktails. You get to have a cocktail, yeah. You have to earn your cocktail. That's right. <laughs> we need some intellectual stimulation here first. Wow. Yeah. Jonathan. Jonathan. You, you said brands uh, don't invite part, right? don't invite participants. Brands don't find participants. Find participants. participants. Okay. I, I messed that up when I said it, but yes, that's what but, I meant to say. But the issue of uh, who defines the brand and customer defines the brand has been conventional wisdom you know, for, for decades. True. Yeah, I don't think brand marketers really believe it. True. You, <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. Do, do you see evidence, A, that they're changing, and B, that there's an imperative for change? Yeah, I think, um, I think they almost have to, but I think it's still really hard. 
I think that the, um, the notion of control is still the most compelling thing. And so there is kind of that arrogance control. Like I say, the thing I loved about Twitter is everybody's flat, and I wish I could get more marketers to think about um, a consumer as equal to them versus someone who needs their help or that they can only give information to when they so choose. Um, but, I, but I do think that struggle with, and you guys face it if you're dealing in the social world, that fear of losing control is something that is still very real. And you're right, the concept's not necessarily a new one. None of the concepts related to marketing and participation age were new necessarily. It was just a new frame in, in which to, to look at them in um, and perhaps more poignant today. Do you feel that though the success of these collaborative companies like, like Uber and Airbnb, is that convincing them that they have to jump on board? I mean, there's nothing more convincing than an enormous valuation, right? I think it makes them afraid that there are competitors to the earlier point that maybe they've never even thought of who aren't even in the space today. If you think of Airbnb or um, or Uber, it'd be interesting to put them back into the timeline. So 10 years ago, I would bet that a company would never go into business knowing that they were breaking the law. Huh. And Good both point. of those companies went into business knowing that there were no laws that supported them actually being in business. They just bet on the fact that there was a need that was strong enough that ultimately those laws would be overturned. And that's, that's what's happening, right? That's truly revolution. That's the definition of a revolution. Yeah. Dana, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.